Hello, Zinger Nation. Welcome back to Moon or Bust, your home for all things altcoins and DeFi. This is flight 47 on the Moon or Bust rocket ship, if you can believe it. Uh, today's space flight will be, will be hosted by me, Logan Ross, and co-hosted by Brian Moore, DeFi developer, and Ryan McNamara, Exit Liquidity Nation. How are you guys doing today? Fantastic. Doing well. Hey, That's how quite, the, quite the name you came up with today, Logan. Just yeah. pulled it right off the top. Yeah, how are you I, doing? I can tell. How, how, how is things in Logan's world? Logan's world is going pretty well. Uh, just keeping it calm, staying busy, trying to, you know, just just stay focused. Just do it. Going, provide the best moon or bust content in the world uh, that I can possibly come up with. Coming up with all these crazy names off the top, so... Uh, yeah, so let's let's talk about a couple safety procedures that we need to get out of the way before we can start the show. Uh, so first up, I need anyone who is willing and able to please activate their like button into the on position. Uh, I need everyone else to comment down below the crypto projects you're looking at this week. Drop tickers, whatever it might be, uh, and maybe let us know why you're looking at them, what you're thinking about them. Uh, and if we get time at the end, we'll go through them all. So uh, after that, while you're down there, I want to point out a couple links in the description below. So first up is the Benzinga Crypto YouTube channel. Uh, you do not want to miss out on this content. It's all the highlights from all of our crypto shows here at Benzinga. If you're new, make sure to subscribe to the main channel as well. Also, we have a Telegram and, and merch. If you join the Telegram, we'll give you a 25% off discount code. So you can get a sick Moon or Bust Ethereum hat designed by yours truly. Uh, and as always, make sure to connect with us on Twitter and, and check out our helpful money site resources in the description as well. Uh, okay, so let's get right into the news. Ryan, you want to tell us about the sushi swap hack that happened? I think Brian could probably do a little bit better job as the DeFi developer, but $3 million were stolen off of SushiSwap from the Miso launch pad. Brian, do you want to go over this in detail a little bit more? <clears throat> um, you Let me pull it up and you, you go ahead and do a little rundown and let me pull up a few. Sure. Things. So this happened, was it yesterday, Logan? There was 865 Ethereum stolen off of Miso, which is a product on SushiSwap for small tokens. It's essentially a launch pad where people can invest in uh, initial DEX offering. So it's similar to ICO, but it's called an IDO. Um, so someone was able to inject malicious code into the software. So everybody trying to get these tokens were ended up just giving their ETH to this guy's wallet. But luckily... There are a lot of nice hackers in crypto. So this guy already gave back the funds and then some. So he stole 864.8 Ethereum, which is about $3 million. And today he gave back 865 Ethereum. So maybe he's earning interest on it or something. Uh, rumor has it that he got some miso soup delivered to his house. So maybe he was paying them back for the miso soup delivered to his house. I, that's not confirmed, but that's what I saw on Twitter. So I mean, this if it was on, like, on Twitter, it's probably like a true. cool guy. I want him to hack me next if he's going to. <laughs> give back the money. Give back the money with some interest. It looks like this attack was uh, called a, a supply chain attack, and I actually don't know too much um, about how that kind of works. I was trying to look into it and get some details, but it's it's a little bit more um, involved or complicated than a um, the the flash loan attacks or you know that kind of exploit. It's not as straightforward or simple as you know, you may, rising the price, and then taking it all out and exiting liquidity or taking everything out of a certain wallet or something. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a supply chain attack. And so it's, this is a new one to me. I, I think it's been around, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. a little different. You have to look into that and report back on what a supply chain attack is next time. I heard that it was a, a malicious code injection attack. Um, and, and I mean, that one seems more more common to me. Are they probably the same thing. I mean, yeah, it's, maybe it's yeah. just another name for it. Uh, anyways, let's see. So how about that new uh, sushi swap NFT platform, Ryan? Yeah, that's really exciting. It's called Show You NFT, and it's coming out this month on SushiSwap. Lots of developers are working on this right now, and it looks like it's going to be the first real big competitor to OpenSea. Everybody uses OpenSea for NFTs right now, and like we've covered on the show, there's been a lot of problems with it from servers, from employees, from a lot of different things on OpenSea. It hasn't been a great experience for many users there. So this is going to be really interesting to see how this SushiSwap NFT marketplace goes over. They're adding some really cool features to it 
For example, you can place bids on NFTs, and while that ETH is usually locked up, say on OpenSea, and you can't use it on Sushi Swap, you'll be able to earn yield on your Ethereum. Mm. So this is going to be like particularly well for the people who have hundreds of NFTs and a lot of Ethereum, and you know they're going out mm -hmm. and, and going on board apes and putting in 30, 40 ETH bids and hoping that they get accepted. Now instead of just having that be locked up on the platform, they mm -hmm. can actually be earning interest on their Ethereum while these bids are placed on NFTs, which I think is really cool. They're also be, they're also fractionalizing NFTs, so you'll be able to get fractionalized NFTs on the platform, which is essentially buying a piece, like a share of an NFT. We'll see if the SEC comes after Sushi for that. I know they're after Uniswap right now, and fractionalized NFTs are likely to be securities, so there will probably be regulation coming for fra fractionalized NFTs. We haven't seen it yet. I mean, it's such a new space, but I really like what Sushi Swap's doing. They've been putting so many new products onto their website, and I, I love where they're going. So, what do you guys have to say about Sushi Swap? About show you NFTs? What's your take? Do you think they? One can thing about them? Sushi Swap, I found my notes about it. <clears throat> um, so, the malicious code and the the whole hack is somebody went into the GitHub and changed the wallet address to their own custom wallet address for the IDO. And so they, uh, you know, everyone depositing funds, just put it straight to this person's, you know, Ethereum wallet. Nice. And he was like, okay, well, now that I got that, look how easy it is. He returned it, but that that's really what happened. Huh. So there was malicious code put into the front end to mm -hmm. change out the wallets and everything like that. So, but Got it wasn't malicious, it. though. It wasn't malicious because he gave it back after a day. It might have been because they threatened to file with the FBI. But I think a lot of these people who do this and return the funds are just trying to protect people from these bugs in the code. And they don't want to go to the government. I mean, so many people in crypto are libertarian. They don't want to deal with the government. Um, right. So, I mean, this is just another way to do it. And honestly, it seems more effective because they keep the funds safe in their own wallet and they exploit something. It gains a lot of attention and then it gets fixed within a day or so instead yep. of actually trying to go to the government to get something done, which would take months or even years to do. Yeah. Kind of like hacktivism. <clears throat> it, it, you know, yeah, I like that. Yeah, you have there's quite a bit of that, and it's I think it's a good thing because you don't have people just straight taking everything, like you said. You have people trying to protect other people's funds, protect a project, and make sure things are growing. Mm -hmm. And I I like that. I mean, I don't want fifty million dollars of mine stolen, but I don't have fifty million dollars. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, once you discover the bug, it's the classic prisoner's dilemma. Whoever you report it to then has the opportunity to just take the money themselves, right? So yep. uh, he has to lock it up, and then hopefully he'll be a good guy. He or she will be a good guy and return the money. Um, okay, let's see. So yesterday, reportedly, uh, a billion, $1.2 billion of ETH disappeared from centralized exchanges. Uh, Glassnode's reporting some different data. Uh, but this one is from, I think it's called Into the Block. Uh, it was the people, it was the company that reported this. Um, we said we haven't confirmed uh, with Glassnode yet, but we're working on it. So if this is true, we'll just report it, uh, you know, tentatively for now uh, and talk about what it could mean if it is true. So, Ryan, you want to take it away? So, yeah, if this is true, one billion dollars, one point two billion dollars of ETH leaving exchanges should be pretty bullish for the asset. So if people are taking their Ethereum off exchanges, typically they aren't looking for liquidity. If you have your crypto on an exchange, you can easily sell it for fiat and then cash out of your investment. Whereas people transferring off of exchanges usually do so for enhanced security to hold over the long term or use with DeFi projects. So if you're using your Ethereum with DeFi projects, you'll be locking it into smart contracts. Maybe you're staking on ETH2 with this much money. Uh, maybe you're using a different program to earn some passive income. But usually it's a really good sign to see Ethereum leave exchanges. That's essentially Ethereum that isn't going to be sold, at least on centralized exchanges, until it's brought back onto these exchanges and sold for fiat currency. So in my opinion, this is something that's really bullish. And we haven't seen this since, what is that, Ever. like April? No, April was this, this is a new record all time. Okay. All time record. That's huge. But the last time we saw anything similar was back in April. And you can see that was right before ETH shot up like 60% or even higher. It looks like it shot up from maybe $2,200 all the way to $4,000. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we don't know if that's going to happen again, but we see when ETH leaves exchanges, especially in high volumes like this, a lot of times it's a good bullish signal for Ethereum.
Yep. And they pointed out the last time this happened, as you said, Ryan, if the price of Ethereum increased by 60% within 30 days. Uh, so I'm, I got my fingers crossed that this is true. Could be good news. Alrighty. Got anything else for us today on the agenda, guys? I think we covered the news. Shall we hop right into the interview? Let's do it. Okay, so today we have with us a, a, a very special guest. His name is Thibaut, and he is a researcher and expert on special economic zones. So I'm going to bring him on to stream. Uh, hey, Thibaut, welcome. Hello, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. How are you doing today? Excellent, excellent. Glad to hear it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm not particularly an expert on special economic zones, so I'm excited to learn today. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your background uh, in, in various industries about special economic zones and then maybe eventually how you got into crypto? Sure, sure. So I'm the co-founder of a firm called the Adrian Opel Group. We're the only business intelligence firm that works with um, exclusively in the SEZ industry. We primarily work with investors who want to put their money in a zone, who want to invest in building a new zone and sort of do all of the background research necessary to guide them through that process. In terms of crypto, um, it's been more of a personal hobby of mine. I first got into crypto uh, in 2013 uh, due to a conference. So I've been seeing sort of the, 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 the different booms and busts over the years and all of the, the, the chaos, um, but recently, it's intersected with my professional career because it turns out that a lot of special economic zones are now trying to adopt regulatory frameworks to promote cryptocurrency, to legalize it in countries that are otherwise illegal. So it's this very fascinating trend on the regulatory side. Okay, so for anyone out there who hasn't heard of special economic zones before, uh, could you just tell us what they are and what the purpose of them is? Sure. So special economic zones are a part of a country that has its own rules and regulations separate from the rest of the country. Think like a Native American reservation that is exempt from federal laws and can have a casino if you're an American mm -hmm. and legal cannabis and so forth. Well, sometimes governments that have a lot of very complicated rules for doing business will do this with a business park or they'll do this sometimes with a whole city. Um, You've probably heard of them. Hong Kong, when it left Britain and rejoined China, rejoined as a special economic zone with a lot of legal autonomy. Uh, Dubai is a city that has, I think, 46, 47 SEZs. It's just hmm. a, a, a city state of city states almost. Wow. Um, there's about 7,500 SEZs in the world, 12,000 total. They're in 70 countries, and they account for this huge percentage of the world economy and nobody's ever heard of them which is why they're so fascinating yeah that is crazy i had no clue that i mean it's, there's so many in dubai what would be the purpose of having so many in one small location sure so in the case of dubai um this is a common misconception dubai did not have any oil so what happened is that you have this you have this this desert country in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and all of their neighbors were politically unstable and had oil so instead of selling oil, what they decided to do was to sell legal stability. And they outsourced the legal system to the best lawyers from the UK, to the best lawyers from Singapore. They created these special economic zones for different industries. Uh, DMCC, Dubai uh, Multi-Commodity Center, uh, Dubai International Financial Center for different industries that had different legal systems. And because all of their neighbors were trying to pump the oil, sort of during the gold rush, you know, the people who made the money weren't the, the, the schmucks who were out there panning for gold. It was the mm -hmm. people selling the pancakes and selling the shovels. So that's basically what Dubai did. Hmm. Fascinating. So if, I don't know if you have an estimate, but what uh, like what portion of the global economy or what effect uh, of the whole total global economy do SEZs play? Are you ready to be somewhat terrified? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> OK, you're going down Walmart. You're looking at all of the plastic crap that they have. Uh -huh. What percentage of it was made in the special economic zone? According to World Bank figures. Huh. Uh, I'll let uh, Ryan guess. 10%. His... About 50%. Wow. So if you're, if you're looking, the, the largest SEZ is a special economic zone in Saudi Arabia. $1 trillion uh, of, of money from the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. 
you know, invested in this thing. Um, the population of these special economic zones, you have cities with populations, 40, 50, 60 million people, you know, living in China, uh, millions of people in India living in them. And many of the people who live in them are only at most vaguely aware. So what this means is that when governments want to try some new legal sort of legal system, and I have some very interesting examples of this, uh, with something like cryptocurrency, which is highly controversial, mm -hmm. the moment they start putting it in SEZs, it's almost like they're testing something to implement on a more mm. widespread national level. So there's very interesting implications. So what have we seen with crypto and SEZs so far? So in 2012, one of the first jurisdictions to start regulating cryptocurrencies was the Cayman Enterprise City in the Cayman Islands. Hmm. Now, Cayman Islands already sort of top rated jurisdictions, maybe a tax haven has its own issues, but it's sort of like the top rated jurisdiction within the top rated jurisdiction already. Right. And they decided to start regulating cryptocurrency. And instead of actually reducing regulation on crypto, they actually increased it. But because they did this before anyone else, it meant that all of the investors who had regulatory concerns started mm -hmm. investing there. So um, a lot of these, the, like uh, the browser Brave and a whole bunch of these, these, these I think coin firm uh, are all based in, in Cayman. Um, mm -hmm. Other interesting examples, it turns out that a lot of these special economic zones have electrical generation. So during downtime, when, you know, you, nobody's using electricity at 3 a.m., right? So, and, and if you have a coal plant, all of that electricity is just wasted. So in the past, what they've done is literal mining, where they actually will smelt metals with the excess electricity and like literally have the metal refineries and smelteries there. In Iran, a country where cryptocurrency is legal. We had this guy on our podcast recently. Um, Iran has legalized Bitcoin in its special economic zones, has whole mining operations, uh, is actually working with all sorts of investors. And what's even crazier is that they're going to start legalizing it for retail investors, hmm. for companies registered on the on the Kish Island uh, hmm. just a few weeks ago. So we're going to see a lot more of that. That's cool. So it seems like SECs are almost like a pilot program before it goes out to the entire country then. Yes. So when, when China reformed from, from socialism to capitalism in the 1980s, um, they had just had this mass famine from rapidly changing everything to communism, where about 50 million people died of famine in China due to economic mismanagement in the 50s. For, for a sense of scale, the entire death toll of all of World War II, including the Holocaust, is 80 million. So 50 million people starve in China, 80 million people die in all of World War II, right? So worst disaster in human history, maybe second worst after World War II. So they really did not want to just like adopt capitalism on the national level when the switch to socialism was so disruptive. Mm -hmm. So they tested it in the special economic zones. And uh, within the first year, 60% of all foreign investment coming to China was coming through the SEZs. Wow. So SEZs have been around for a long time then. It's not like they're a new phenomenon. When did they start coming about? So I've actually been doing a lot of research to this. Um, if, if this, That's sort of an interesting rabbit hole. But uh, the Roman Empire, to give you a sense okay. of scale, one of their enemies was the city-state of Rhodes. Um, Rhodes is like, you know, sort of the island that's right next to Turkey, right? Rhodes had all of this massive navies and the Romans had to attack by sea but their navy, these were crap. Worst of all, they'd been fighting Carthage at this point. This is 166 BC. They'd been fighting Carthage at this point for 30 years. So their manpower was totally exhausted. And Rhodes was, there could have been an alternate timeline where Rhodes unseated Rome and wiped out the Roman Empire before it had a chance to be born. But Rhodes had one critical economy. Its entire government budget was funded by a 2% tariff on all goods going through their ports. So the Romans created a special economic zone with a 0% tariff right next to Rhodes. And in five years, Rhodes was so bankrupt that they voluntarily begged to join the Roman Empire. Wow. That's a cool story. So uh, moving back to crypto, Thibaut, have you consulted for any cryptocurrency projects before? Um, no. 
Okay. So what's the typical role? To, like, do you see blockchain playing a role in these SECs for the, for the companies that you do consult for? Yeah. So um, one of the companies that we consult for, have you heard of Pronomos? Mm -mm. It sounds familiar, but I'm not right. familiar well, with I'll it. I'll it for the audience anyway. So Pronomos is a VC fund. The anchor investor is Peter Thiel of PayPal. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, my wife works there. And you should talk to Patrick Friedman. I could give you an intro. He's the guy who runs the fund. I would love um, to. That'd be so awesome. Pronomos is actually investing, uh, and they have a whole bunch of famous LPs, but I don't want to get in trouble, but but <laughs> but well-known well known figures. I, I, I think Balaji is public, so I'll, I'll say him. Hmm. But what they're doing is that they're actually going out, and they're actually investing in sort of like the really futuristic projects that are going to make the cryptocurrency regulation happen. So it's sort of the invisible underpinning and you have some servers, you know, you have a registered company in a zone, you have the servers in that zone. And as long as you're not dealing with US investors, you have to deal with SEC, um, you can bring in investors from anywhere in the world and they'll be, uh, they'll be exempt. So they're looking at projects in, in Honduras, uh, Nigeria, they've already invested in uh, looking at other projects in Africa. Um, yeah, don't want to get in trouble, but uh, very interesting stuff. So Cool. And I saw that one of your services is information assurance, where you help companies verify and secure data. What are your thoughts on the intersection between information assurance and crypto and blockchain technology? So I can't really comment too much about that, but it's actually not information assurance, or I guess that's part of it. That's really the big use for blockchain right now, but it's for online company registries. Um, because if you if you just have like some random dude who just starts like a blockchain registry, right? You you, you release the, the 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 software online, you get a bunch of users. It's not actually tied to any legal system, so it it, it does. You, the U.S. government doesn't recognize this in contract law. But if you're tied to say the government of I don't know, let's let's just make up a country, say Nigeria or something like that, and you're or Cayman Islands, right? And you're tied indirectly because the SEZs often can act as a metaphorical user interface between you and the government. So you're actually registering your company with the zone and the zone itself is on the blockchain. That actually creates a situation where you can implement these technologies legally in a way that normally kind of bypasses having to like change legislation to have blockchain company registration recognized by the U.S. government. So very interesting ways you can hack and bypass the legal system. Hmm. So turning back to regulation for a second, uh, how should the U.S. And, and other sovereign countries, and maybe how, how will SEZs play into this as well, how should they handle crypto regulation? Um, I can't really speak to that simply because I'm not a, an, an expert on crypto regulation. But my, my own perspective is that, and this is just sort of a personal opinion, not a professional hmm. opinion, is that the government should create sort of sandbox environments where people can, hey, you signed this document, you know, maybe I'm going to lose everything, and you 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 acknowledge and you just try whatever, and and maybe it turns out to be stupid. But hmm. I, I really think that's sort of the the approach that um, is going to generate the most innovation. Interesting. It's like we saw that Bitcoin beach in El Salvador, like a little test city. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. I'm that guy in two days. Very don't know anything about it yet, but uh, interesting project. Mm -hmm. So, Thibaut, you guys also provide cybersecurity <laughs> audits to your companies who are in SEZs. Why is this particularly necessary for companies that are in special economic zones? Um, you know, it's just sort of a standard package of IT services. Uh, one of our co-founders, Herzon Flores just used to be doing cybersecurity. He did cybersecurity for Virginia police. So it's just like, hey, let's just toss that in as sort of a service we offer. But really, you know, our, our the, the bulk of our services, right, is mostly due diligence. It's mostly, hey, I want to invest in XYZ zone um, and working with investors on that front to get into the zone. And I have some interesting sort of actually examples that are quite relevant right now. Um, right now, one of the big things that's, 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 that's going on is Belarus. The Belarus Industrial Park, right, has announced this complete cryptocurrency sandbox. But 
you know, people, I'm sure your, your, your listeners, or at least a good percentage of them will know that there are massive, you know, uh, protests against the Belarusian government, right? There are massive situations where uh, the government was almost basically overthrown because it was so corrupt by the people and massive, you know, horrible police crackdowns, uh, horrible treatment of protesters, right? So we're kind of like the guys you'd hire before you go to Belarus to figure out, hey, if you go here or if you go to some other country, um, you're going to get in trouble in all sorts of weird ways. So my, my next question for you, Tebow, is about the, the types of blockchain implementation that you've seen in SEZs. Is it mostly like, say, payment processing where you can send payments like cross borders for very cheap? Or is it more adoption of private blockchains within a company or an investment? Or is it more like blockchain platforms like uh, Ethereum or Solana where you can interact with programs on a blockchain? So... It's, it's, it's kind of disappointing. You don't really see that many. So what, what, if, if you're talking about the well-established special economic zones that are already in existence, you don't actually see that many real day-to-day -day applications of blockchain yet. However, to the extent that it is arising, uh, it's much more on the payment processing side. Um, it's less that the blockchains themselves are using the, 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 the sorry, the, the, the special economic zones themselves are using blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. What it is, is that it's more that the, uh, the, 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 the people who are setting up these companies in order to operate in a given region are relocating to the zones. And the zones are basically bending over backwards, going really, you know, all out uh, in order to sort of help make that happen. Hmm. That makes um, sense. Interesting, interesting example, right? So in May of this year, two of Dubai's most long-standing special economic zones, th these SEZs have been around for, you know, 40 years. The uh, DMCC and the DIFC, Dubai International Financial Center. Um, these zones typically stayed away from crypto. These zones very much uh, headquarters of, say, Blackstone, you know, Warburg Pincus type old school Wall Street private equity firms, Middle Eastern headquarters for these companies. And typically the zones that have done crypto, you know, the, the zones that have gone for crypto have been kind of like the zones in Iran or the zones in Belarus. And they've been kind of the SECs in weird place. As of the last six months, the big trend that you're seeing with kind of this this you know third big bubble in the last like six years sort of coming to an end is that the zones have realized hey crypto may crash and rise or whatever but it's going to be here to stay and if they're not sort of on the DeFi bandwagon uh, they're going to get left behind so they're adopting regulatory frameworks which on paper look like they're imposing all of these sanctions on crypto but by actually creating this environment um, are actually able to sort of reassure investors that these are going to be stable places to invest in. So have you seen that special economic zones that have made regulation for cryptocurrency have an influx of investors come to them over the past year with blockchain exploding and crypto going up so much? Yes. Not only do they have an end. So Cayman Enterprise City has, I th it's either 200 or 250 spots. All 200 and 250 are full with a huge waiting list for any office space you see. Um, I, I, I spoke to a guy who ran a random textile park company in El Salvador. He runs El Salvador's biggest textile special economic zones. You know, all they do is like make t-shirts and like rubber gloves too, and inter good, good, useful stuff. And he wakes up one day, reads the news, huh, cool. El Salvador is, you know, adopting Bitcoin, doesn't think much of it, opens his inbox and has, you know, 900 emails from random people cold emailing him to relocate to his own. And he's like, what in the world is going on? You know, and you're hearing the most crazy story. As soon as one of these zones even announces crypto, um, it, they, they, they get bombarded. But mm. the problem is that these zones have no ability to identify, say, Ponzi schemes from, you know, legitimate projects. Mm. So it's, it's, they're also terrified. Uh, a lot of the ones are, are full of Ponzi scheme. It's, it's a total, it's a total mess right now. So.
So it sounds like countries and their citizens have a lot to gain from introducing these crypto special economic zones, attracting lots of innovation. Uh, but they do have to, you know, start small, work their way up, learn the valuable lessons about the Ponzi's and the real projects. Um, that's cool, though. What would you say the most important role that crypto or blockchain plays in these special economic um, zones? So in, in, in one, one really interesting trend is that a lot of these zones, there's like every possible imaginable industry has a zone and the level of specificity, the level of granularity. Think of zones as like a tailored legal system to target a very granular specific industry, right? And I'll give you an example. I was talking to a guy who does non-woven fabrics. Think like wool or rubber gloves, plastic blue tarp, all of that's non-woven fabrics. And I'm like, so tell me more about the textiles industry. And he got really pissed off. And he's like, I'm not textiles, I'm non-woven fabric. Don't get it wrong. <laughs> you know, totally different industry. Uh -huh. And like, like that's sort of the level of niches, right? And a lot of these zones, were office parks. A lot of these special economic zones were like, like you know, rows of computers, cubicles, whatever, uh, in the Philippines, all over the world. And the workers are just never coming back to the offices. It's not a two week lockdown. It's not a six month lockdown. They're all working from home. None of them want to go back to the cubicle. Um, and now all of these zones have this infrastructure for office space, which could be adopted for crypto, could become, you know, startup incubators. Mm -hmm. And they're suddenly left scratching their heads. So I, I kind of think that the, these governments are slow moving. Um, and I'd say that they're, they're trying to use cryptocurrency and blockchain as sort of a replacement. It's in, in, in half the cases, it's a replacement for anchor tenants who disappeared. And in the other half of cases, they're kind of late to the bandwagon and they're desperately trying to find their way to get in. So it's, it's generally one of two things. And occasionally you have some really forward thinking, you know, jurisdiction, you have three or four um, that, that actually are, and uh, but yeah, that, that, that actually sort of are, are, are forward thinking, but usually it's fear and uh, fear of missing out. Yeah, I can see that. Well, how big are special economic zones? Like it, did, uh, what's the range or how can you tell where it, it's located? All right, so I have two sort of extreme stories. Um, there, the U.S. has something called foreign trade zones. There's about 250, 300 of them. All they are is that goods that enter and exit the foreign trade zone legally haven't entered the U.S. So the idea is that you're building a car, you import the tires from you know, Germany or whatever, you put them onto the car, and they don't have to pay the tariff toll. So the U.S. is like the most basic, yeah. lowest level of SCZ. They barely even count. I, I read online that in San Jose, California, when I was visiting there, there's a special economic zone. So I message the guy and I'm like, hey, can I visit the zone? And he's like, oh, sure. And the first bad sign is he says, nobody's visited me in yours. <laughs> um, so he takes me to this, you know, 40 story building. Right. And I go into this building and I go up this elevator and there's this dusty little office that is, <laughs> um, you know, three meters by two meters, like <laughs> this, this like dusty tiny closet, one extreme. And that was the foreign trade zone. That 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 huh. was. Um, uh, so on the on the largest end, um, you, you have a in El Salvador the same I, I, within a few months of 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 uh, El Salvador announcing that they were going to do Bitcoin. China announced a zone several hundred square kilometers that's going to encompass twenty percent of El Salvador's coastline. So mm -hmm. so if you look at these zones in, the, in desert countries like Saudi Arabia or even the UAE or Oman, right? You have zones that are hundreds of square kilometers. So it's really the whole gamut. In terms of population, once again, dusty closet, uh, yeah, Chinese one. and population. <clears throat> so. mm -hmm. How do you delegate uh, a special economic zone? Like, how, how do you just say like, hey, this is the zone. This is what we're doing. So there's two ways that special economic zones uh, come about. Um, the first is sort of application-based. Think a, a government official with a Sharpie drawing on a map, from now on, this area over here will be the special economic zone. That's kind of like the China model, you know? You know, it's it, the pointing at the map, the tapping, we will have economic development. Um, 
The other model is application based. So that's like Colombia, where if you own, say, two or three square kilometers of land and meet this long checklist of requirements, you file an application and you get um, you get special economic zone status on their land. So sometimes they're started by the government. Sometimes they're started by business. Uh, we got stats at our company on this. One third are, are purely government. One third are purely private and one third public private partnership. So it's almost exactly evenly divided. Um, but the extent of the private designation is pretty incredible because you have the city of Gurugram, uh, uh, Gurgaon in India. It, it, they switched the names about 10 years ago. And the entire zone has private water system, private police, private fire department, private electricity, private <laughs> waste management. Nothing is done by the government at all. And you have zones that are taking this even further in Honduras. Where you can even apply to have entirely privatized legal systems for all civil law. So anything that's not criminal law that's in these Honduras ZAs, that's in these special economic zones, it goes to a fully privatized legal system within the zone. And it's scaring a lot of people. And, you know, whether or not it works out, I think, is uh, still up for debate. But they, they go pretty far sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's by the way, crazy. population one million. So wow, Jeez. that's incredible, and that's super interesting. I'm really surprised I haven't heard of that, and I'm sure yeah. that's a super interesting case study to research about. Uh, have you done some research on this? Like, how is it really playing out? Because I haven't heard of it. How's what playing out? Sorry, oh, privatization in, in these SEZs that are doing this. Um, as far as I can tell. It's a roll of the dice. Most of the time you're going to get a two to five and not much will happen either way. Sometimes you get a six and you get the city of Shenzhen, you know, which goes from a fishing village of 60,000 to a mega city of 60 million in like 40 years and accounts for 60% of China's investment and 70% of their patents. You know, you get retarded, crazy results one way. Sometimes you get golden triangle less easy in Myanmar. The legal autonomy for some zones enables the worst in humanity. So the triads have their own special economic zone in Laos on the border with Myanmar, and they have a casino, but it's known for human trafficking. Uh, 245 women were abducted and forced into prostitution, recently freed by Laotian authorities in this zone. You have wildlife smuggling. Um, and there's actually YouTube videos. If you look up uh, Golden Triangle... Uh, special economic zone on YouTube. They 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 ma mass manufacture methamphetamines. Um, they they have they have like lions that they like make fight in cages with each other and bet. Uh, they have like wow. all sorts of animals that they take apart for traditional medicine. So you have the worst possible in humanity and the best possible. And it's you know you're, you're kind of gambling as a country and there's there's not really much of a way to predict what the results will be. These are wild. One last thing from from me is, <clears throat> can uh, we saw you talking about a startup society? Can you just tell us a brief example? We don't have to go too deep into it, but what a startup society is and how they correlate to SEZs. Sure. So I started in 2015 a nonprofit think tank called the Startup Societies Foundation. I left in 2017. Um, a startup society is just like anybody who's trying to create a society de novo. So say the country of Catalonia before it becomes a country, while it's still like an independence movement is a startup society or a special economic zone could be another type. Gotcha. Interesting. So I have a question for you. Say the US government uh, contracts you to create a crypto sandbox in the country. What would you pitch to them? Ooh, good question. Um, you know, what, what I would do probably, and this is just sort of the way I am, is I would do a crap ton of research and I would find a ton of people who've done a lot of research um, and I'd go about it by interviewing about two or 300. And I know I'm not just giving you an answer like plastics, but I'd go about, I'd try to interview two or 300 business people who do cryptocurrency um, at, at all sizes, very new people, people who are sort of on the very high end of companies, very well established. And I'd get, you know, all of their top five regulatory pain points, uh, get all the interviews for the top, you know, five regulatory pain points for 200 people. And uh, based off of that, I try to come up with like the three 
I, I wouldn't try to do too much. I just try to fix the three biggest, most common pain points to all of the interviews. And really, I think that the the best results for these kind of things is to, you know, really ask the people involved and, and not try to do it in the abstract. Although I'm sure that if I was like a crypto lawyer, I could just say, you know, plastics or whatever. Very cool. And does location matter when it comes to crypto? Yes. Yes, it does. And I, I'd say that it matters for three reasons. One, you probably are actually going to be doing, to take advantage of a lot of the incentives, you actually have to be physically present. So you want to be in a nice location where there's not corruption, that's really beautiful. Um, I, I live in Switzerland. Uh, I actually live 20 minutes from Liechtenstein, which is one of the, the crypto capitals of the world, and maybe 30 minutes to the other direction from Zug, right? And it's such a beautiful country that that's totally why people are coming, even if the regulations aren't, say, as good as they could be elsewhere. Um, the next reason why location matters is because the regulation can change. The voters of a country can just say overnight, new election comes as a coup, you know. Um, OK, we're just getting rid of the special economic zones. And by the way, uh, we want you to either go to jail for 15 years or turn in all of your keys and we're taking all of your crypto, you know. So that totally can happen. And in fact, I'm sure it will happen. I'm sure at some point the government, if there's enough crypto rich people that are there for a conference, will just like start arresting people and demanding keys on trumped up stuff. So number one, location actually matters. Number two is uh, uh, you don't want, you know, to have a corruption. And number three is electricity costs. The average cost per kilowatt hour globally is 14 cents. Um, you can get half that in some places. So if you're especially doing mining, uh, that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. However, like, like those zones I mentioned in Iran, you know, it's, 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 they, they in fact will subsidize your electricity in some cases. So. Interesting. So earlier this year, we saw China ban Bitcoin mining. They've basically taken control over it and, and issued their own central bank digital currency instead. Are we seeing China do any experiments in their special economic zones with crypto? Okay. Want to know something? Alar this is, this, I'm going to blow your minds again. Are you ready? Please do. So Let's hear it. 2,500 special economic zones in China right? Wow. How many Chinese special economic zones are there run by Chinese corporations outside of China? Oh, I, I, it's either going to be a really high number or I'm imagining a really high number is going to be a high number. But could you say the question one more time? How many companies are there run by the Chinese government and Chinese state run companies, Chinese special economic zones outside of China? Huh. Well, there's about 10,000 of them worldwide and 2,500 are in China already. So that leaves about 7,500. I have no clue. Maybe 2,000 if it's a high number. Well, you're, you're over it, but there's 500 okay. Chinese SEZs outside of China. And wow. so um, what qualifies it as a Chinese SEZ? Just like a special okay, economic fine. zone that's run by any Chinese company. That's okay. Okay. Our definition is if the usually zones have an operator which is kind of like gotcha. the country that owns the land builds the buildings cleans the lawn whatever if that okay. company's chinese we have a by the way we're about to publish the world's first map of every single special economic zone on earth huh. it took us two years of work wow. um but but one of the data we collected was to see where all the chinese zones were and it's terrifying because <laughs> in some of the most extreme cases we found Chinese SEZs outside of U.S. military bases. So the U.S. has all of these overseas bases. And the, like, like a bunch of idiots, the U.S. government is, you know, uh, hey, we're going to go in through military imperialism, spend $2 trillion, and then leave Afghanistan 20 years later. The Chinese are like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build a shopping mall right next to the U.S. military base and invite TGI Fridays to the shopping mall so all the off-duty soldiers will spend money on U.S. government money in our shopping malls. So <laughs> you find like Chinese shopping malls outside of every military base in Africa. Um, wow. you, you, you find That's that crazy. those military bases, the only connection they have to the outside world are Chinese freeways and Chinese railroads, you know? Huh. So it, I don't think it's actually that the Chinese are gonna shut it off. I just think it's that they're like taking all the money from the U.S. government basically indirectly. Huh. Um, in terms of uh, uh, cryptocurrency, um, you know, the Chinese are always up to, uh, they, they really want to promote, you know, sort of the, the, the digitization of the, of, of the yuan and promoting sort mm -hmm. of the digital yuan 
as the one world currency that's run and administered by China. So, you know, I think you're going to just see that be implemented um, in all of the zones. I have kind of an interesting little anecdote of this. And I don't want to mention the zone because they're good people. I don't want to embarrass them. But one of the largest special economic zones in Africa, our team is about to do a visit. And we email them and we're like, hey, we heard your zone was funded by the Chinese. And they're like, no, no Chinese people here. You know, it's all Chinese characters. It's all WeChat pay, every single store, um, uh, you know, giant Chinese flag that says uh, 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 sort of, you know, welcome home. And um, you have zones with names like Hualing Special Economic Zone mm -hmm. in Georgia, you know, the country of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So. Hmm. So uh, I'm guessing that these countries let China have these special economic zones just for the, the purpose of developing their own economies as well. Yes. And. You know, to, to, to be fair, I think the reason why China has done so well with the SECs is because it's actually pretty good for, you know, the, the, the local people. And yeah, there's, there's problems, there's chicaneries, there's corruptions. But many of the time, it's like all the men in your town suddenly get jobs that pay twice as much working for the Chinese factory where there's been no development in a war-torn country for mm -hmm. 20 years. You know, you're going to be very supportive of China, right? They're doing what sort of uh, America wishes it did during the Cold War, but a zillion times better. And I think they learned it from the US. Hmm. Very interesting. Do you uh, do any, like personally, do you invest in cryptos? Do you follow any projects or do, are you into that space at all? No comment. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> that makes sense. Are you interested in, in NFTs? Um. Okay, I think NFTs are totally stupid. And <laughs> the reason why is because I think intellectual property is like an outdated sort of institution. We need to be moving towards, you know, open source, copyright free. So uh, to the extent that NFTs are, are, are like for people claiming ownership of like digital assets, I think that's like really the wrong direction. Um, however, I, I imagine that there's a ton of other non-trivial applications out there. So I'm, I'm not hating on those, but I, I am hating on, uh, what is it, crypto kitties or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll take it. It's interesting to see that these digital assets are the first type of NFT to really get put into the mainstream, though. We did see Israel uh, use NFTs in a pilot program for, I think it was, land deeds and car loans. So it's really cool to see governments like catching an eye for NFTs. And it's going to be really interesting to see where it goes. Because like you said, Tebow, it's not just about these digital assets or verifying like digital IP. There's a million different use cases for them, and we're only scratching the surface right now. So you said land deeds and car loans? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's pretty cool. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. That's that's like exactly what it should be used for. Right. Yeah. It, I imagine it. <clears throat> it's going to be your whole identity, like in the future, where you're going to have, you know, your own. Your it's going to be tokenized, whatever your social, your everything, and maybe hidden. But you know what I mean. I think that's how you can verify everything and never get lost and all that other stuff. There, like you said, there's a ton of um, different use cases for NFTs not just profile pictures or images like you, you know, cause I understand the uh, eh, kind of thing about that. that but at the sense. same time, I feel like there is a need to uh, essentially show off on the internet flex, if you will, like, like people will buy Rolexes and fancy cars and, with so much time that people spend on internet these days, I think it only makes sense to have a way for people to show off on the internet like they yeah. do with fancy cars or, or other things that might not really have the tangible value that they're worth. I mean, there, there are a lot of things like that in the physical, tangible world. And, and I think it, to a degree, makes sense, although silly. You know, I don't think that the government should like regulate it or anything, but I just wish that instead of showing off, you know, so in the, in the, in the Middle Ages, right, which was like a time when everything was like a special economic zone, right? It's this age of totally crazy city-states um, so my, my other hobby outside of SCC is medieval history, but in the middle ages, like there really was this, this, um, this attitude of like, Hey, the rich people are going to show off by like building church and public's works and funding the arts and funding sciences. Mm -hmm. And I, I, and I really hate seeing Lamborghinis and Rolexes when 
we could be crowdfunding Elon Musk to go build like a colony on the moon, or we could be like, you know, funding like fishing fleets to get rid of all of that plastic in the ocean. So I, I just wish it was channeled in that direction. I know that totally makes sense. So I saw on your website, you like to do a lot of book reviews. Uh, could you tell us maybe how you got into that, what you've been reading lately and any recommendations you might have for us here on Moon or Bust? Sure. So for book reviews, um, this is my personal website. This isn't my, my, my company. Uh, just for fun, I decided uh, I dropped out of college about five years ago. And I decided that instead of going to college, I was going to read a book a week, nonfiction, and review it. Huh. And I've stuck to it on average. The last few months haven't been that great. But I've, I've, it, it averages out to like 1.2 books a week or something like that. Wow. Uh, um, and I mostly read medieval history. So mm -hmm. I've been starting in chronological order and, and going to the present from about 500 BC, trying to read like five to 10 books per century. Um, so it's, and I'm at about 1200. So I've got like decades left to reach the present because it's, but, but any, anyways, um, in terms of history books, um, this goes into special economic zones. I recommend a book called Lost Enlightenment. And what this book is about is, there was this lost Islamic golden civilization, you know, in Central Asia during the Middle Ages, which uh, basically reached like late 1600s level of technology in like 1800 AD. And they totally get wiped out by the Mongols and the region like loses like a quarter of its population goes backward. So you have this situation where there's a super technologically advanced society that pops up in a place that you haven't heard of, you know, a real lost civilization, they go back. So it also tells you that, you know, technology, it's not just an upwards linear line. The, the, the Italians in the Renaissance then have to pick up the torch. Um, and it, it, it declines and it sort of stays low for a long time. Uh, so lost enlightenment is, is a good one. Um, in terms of special economic zones, another good book is On China by Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger who actually negotiated a lot of the opening up of China. And it's the history of like how China used special economic zones to reform its economy, to, you know, totally change its society. And it turns out that there's this like four foot 10, five foot five, I don't know how tall he is, but this tiny little guy called Deng Xiaoping, who everybody, uh, who, who nobody's heard of, who saved the most human lives of like anybody in the 20th century by building special economic zones and bringing free market to China and like tripling the GDP per capita, you know? Um, so that's the next one. I really like Lost Enlightenment, uh, sorry, Lost Enlightenment mm -hmm. uh, on Central Asia, uh, on China by Henry Kissinger. And I think that the third good one is Seeing Like a State by James Scott, which is just a book about how when you look at things from the perspective of statistics and government planning, it just distorts your view on everything. So, so hope, hope that's not too much. I really like No, those. it's not. I, I got those written down. Tivo, how do you find time to read so, so many books? Uh, I just listen to audiobooks. So huh. that's, I'm like just always listening to audiobooks every minute I have downtime. Very cool. Uh, so, oh. What's that? No, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, I just wanted to mention in, in the time that we have left, yeah. Um, a few sort of interesting crypto things, if, if we had time in, in SEZs, yeah, please I do. think might be, might be kind of interesting. Um, so one of them, that's, that's what one trend that is, is quite interesting is remember how earlier I mentioned, and my wife, by the way, wrote a paper about this for the World Free Zones Organization. Um, so remember how I mentioned how a lot of SEZs have lost business from work from home? Typically... Mm -hmm to take advantage of the regulations in an SEZ, what you had to do was you had to be like physically based there, like physically doing business there. And in some cases, you even have to pay for the cost of, the go of a government agent to come like inspect to make sure that you're actually in the zone, not there on paper. Some zones have decided because of work from home to start letting companies take advantage to register as like a work from home company in the zone and start taking advantages of the legal system of the zone working from home. So you could be at a laptop anywhere in the world. And if you're in the right special economic zones, be taking advantage of a legal system 
that really like benefits your need working for and i think that that from a legal perspective is kind of a loophole and who knows if it will last but if it does last it's going to i think totally change the game for companies doing all of these things that are very regulatorily difficult from a crypto perspective awesome well, if you guys want to find, find out more about Tebow's work, we have his website linked in the description below. You can go check that out. Uh, Tebow, if you have any closing thoughts or shout outs you want to give, tell the audience where to connect with you. The floor is yours. Yes. Well, I add 100% of the people who connect to me on LinkedIn, and I eventually right. respond to 100% of my messages. So everybody add me and... Um, I'd love to uh, help you with any SEZs or send you any books or whatever. Um, so that's the best place to find me. Uh, the company is Adrianople Group, um, which you have linked, I imagine. And uh, yeah, that's that. All righty. That has been this uh, episode of Moon or Bust. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave us a like and we can get more of this content for you in the future. Uh, for now, we're signing off. Stick around for pre-market prep. It will be linked in the chat. Uh, but thanks for tuning in. We will see you next week. Peace. Thanks.